So with uh, no further ado, um, I would like to uh, present to you our uh, afternoon speaker. Uh, it will be Noelle Garrett, and she is speaking about uh, mobile app privacy at scale. So please give her a warm schmookon welcome. Hey, good afternoon. My name is <laughs> My name is Noelle Garrett, and I'm a cadet at the United States Military Academy at West Point. I'm in my senior year at the academy and I'm majoring in information technologies with a Eurasian studies minor. The presentation I'm about to give covers an independent study I started last year. During the study, I captured network traffic from different mobile iOS apps in an attempt to develop a system for assigning a score to different apps in regards to their use of, private, of users' private information. The link to the GitHub repository on my slide contains the raw captured network traffic files from my tests my Python scripts for assigning scores, and the instruction sheet for the demo I'll do at the end of this presentation. So this is a quick overview of what I'm gonna cover during the presentation. I'm gonna start by discussing the problem I wanted to solve and the end goal of my study. Then I'm gonna cover relevant background information like statistics on this topic and previous studies done. During methods, I'll discuss my thought process of setting up the study and how I collected all the data. For analysis, I'll review, the raw, the raw network, I'll review how I analyze the raw network traffic and develop code to assign privacy ratings to apps. Finally, I'm gonna end with a demo showing how the man in the middle proxy works and the code for scoring apps. The problem my study set out to solve was that Apple devices run on iOS, which is a closed source operating system. Aside from the permissions that can be granted to apps, users have no way of telling what information is leaving their device or what apps are doing with the information they have permissions for. In order to combat this, I wanted to lay the groundwork for an automated way to rate mobile apps on their use of users' private information. This would be meant to help users inform themselves which mobile applications are best at keeping their private information private and which are collecting information for their more nefarious means. So why is this all important? Well, in 2018, 365.2 billion US dollars were made in revenue by the mobile apps market. However, 90% of apps in the App Store and on the Google Play Store are free. This means a significant portion of that 365.2 billion US dollars is made through a combination of in-app purchases, in-app ads, and data trading. In fact, seven out of 10 mobile applications actually admit to reporting users' personal data to third-party tracking companies like Google Analytics and Facebook Graph API. Given that data trading is an issue, why did I choose to focus specifically on iOS devices and not something like Android? Well, first off, 45% of smartphone users in the United States use an iPhone, and the average household owns more than two Apple devices. There are also significant differences between the Android operating system and iOS. Android's OS is a modified version of Linux in open source software. Because of this, the OS running on Android devices is easier for users to view. Even though Android devices aren't a completely cleared box, clear box due to the fact it's a modified version of Linux, users can still easily get a strong understanding of the way Android devices function. In contrast to Android's open sourced OS, Apple's iOS is a black box to the public. This means that how an Apple device and the apps on that device choose to act or to behave is almost a complete mystery to the majority of its users. Unfortunately, only those users whose entire jobs consist of reverse engineering things like operating systems and app code have a good understanding of how iOS functions. Before beginning my research, I looked for previously conducted studies with relevant topics to the one that I wanted to conduct. These are the three that I came across. The first is privacy nutrition labels. This is a study that looked at how to best present privacy policies and privacy information to users. Due to the fact that I wanted the end results of this study to be relevant and easily understandable by average users, I found this investigation into the presentation of privacy information very applicable. This study found that presenting privacy information in the form of nutrition labels was the most effective due to the familiar format. The next study I looked at was called Security Grades. This study was perhaps the most similar to the one that I wanted to conduct. It took different mobile applications and compared the privacy permissions 
the users expected the app to need and ask for versus the permissions the apps actually needed and asked for. The results from this comparison were used to calculate a grade from A to F and published to their website. While this study is a strong start for helping users understand the relationship between mobile applications and their private information, it, the study only reviewed Android applications. Additionally, I believe the study did not consider enough factors to be able to assign a proper security grade. The last study I looked at was called Security Predictions. This study attempted to develop an algorithm for predicting how secure a user's private information would be on different mobile applications. The final alg algorithm included factors like the app's purchase cost and the number of developers that worked on that app. The study's research into what different kinds of existing apps did with information helped give me a baseline understanding of what I should expect from different apps in terms of privacy. This is a general overview of, my research, of what my research methods look like. I first selected which mobile applications I wanted to rate. Next, I proceeded to intercept the network traffic from the different mobile applications using man-in-the-middle proxy. After that, I turned the raw network traffic into network stat files so that I could better understand what information I had gathered. Finally, I decided what, which factors were needed in order to properly score apps in terms of privacy of information. The apps that I decided to rate were the top 20 free mobile apps on the App Store during 2019, as rated by Mashable. Most of these apps you've probably seen before or at the very least used. They include apps like Spotify, Google Maps, YouTube, and Twitter. So before I go into how I collected the network traffic for mobile applications, I'm first going to cover at a high level a man-in-the-middle attack, which is an interception of an HTTPS connection. Normal HTTPS connections typically begin with a client and a server. In this case, the client is an iPhone and the server is Facebook's web server. The client attempts to initiate a TCP connection with Facebook using HTTPS. Facebook then responds to the client's connection request with its certificate. The client device has an internal list of certificate authorities and compares the certificate authority of Facebook certificate to this internal list. If Facebook's certificate authority matches up with the one on the client's internal list, the certificate is authenticated by the client and communication between the two can proceed. Now I know that most people here instinctively tie man in the middle with negative connotations. Most likely, you all know of some instance where information was stolen through the use of a man in the middle attack. However, man in the middle proxies are actually used in more than just negative ways. In fact, organizations use man in the middle proxies to do simple things like monitor tra traffic going in and out of their network. For this kind of attack, the third party entity reroutes the connection between the two systems so that all communication between the client and Facebook must first go through the third party. If done properly, neither, neither the client nor Facebook are aware that another entity is in intercepting the communications. Just like in a normal HTTPS connection, the client attempts to initi initiate a TCP connection with Facebook. However, this TCP connection from the client is then intercepted by man in the middle, which subsequently sends out its own TCP initiation request to Facebook. When Facebook responds with this certificate, this is intercepted by man in the middle, which then generates its own certificate to forward on to the client. Issues can arise when the client goes to check man in the middle certificate authority against its internal list. Because man-in-the-middle certificate authority is not included within the client's internal list, the connection cannot be authenticated and is thus terminated. In order to rectify this situation, man-in-the-middle certificate authority needs to be added to the client's internal list. On iOS devices, this is done by adding a profile. I'm sure some of your organizations might have actually had you do this so that they can monitor your network traffic when you're, on, when you're using their network. I know the Army forced me to do this. So just a quick warning, if you're thinking about attempting to recreate or do something similar to my study, adding a profile to your device does leave it more vulnerable. So make sure to delete the profile once you've finished capturing traffic and read the disclaimers that Apple gives you when you're attempting to install a new profile. Now that man in the middle certificate authority is inside of the client's internal list, the connection can be authenticated and proceeds. Traffic then sent by the client is intercepted by man in the middle and decoded using man in the middle's private key. 
Man in the Middle then re-encrypts the traffic using Facebook's public key and forwards the traffic to Facebook. Traffic directed back to the client from Facebook is then decrypted and re-encrypted in a very similar fashion. So during my studies, I ran into very significant issues with SSL pinning. When SSL pinning is used, Facebook hard codes what its certificate authority should be into its app. For simplicity's sake, this is like Facebook telling the client that its certificate authority should always be blue. However, when Man in the Middle generates its certificate, it uses a certificate authority with a different color than Facebook's, in this case, orange. The issue arises when Man in the Middle sends the client an orange certificate claiming to be from Facebook. The client knows that Facebook's certificate authority should be blue, so sending in an orange one means that the client will no longer trust the connection. Now you're probably wondering what apps that I plan to capture traffic for actually use SSL pinning. The answer is quite a lot of them, just a little under 50% to be more, more precise. The majority of them were social media apps like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Snapchat. So is SSL pinning a good or a bad thing? Well, in terms of this study, and for really anyone who would like to know more about what information these apps are taking from them, it's not a great thing. In order to defeat SSL pinning, you need to use a rooted device. Since I wanted this project to be replicable by average users, I decided not to pursue apps that used SSL pinning because the average user does not own a rooted device. However, in terms of the security of the traffic that's leaving your phone, it's pretty good. SSL pinning makes it extremely difficult to intercept network traffic, so even if the app is stealing all of your information, at least nobody can steal it from them. After successfully setting up the man in the middle proxy, I moved into capturing the network traffic from my 20 different apps. My collection process started by obtaining an Apple device. I used, for this study, I used an iPad mini that was at the time running on iOS 13.1. I then reset the iPad to make sure that I was working with the blank, blank slate and installed the man in the middle certificate onto the device by adding a new profile. Once my iPad was set up, I deleted most of the apps that were automatically installed by Apple. However, there were a few that Apple wouldn't allow me to, to delete, like the photos and health apps. So these remained on the device for the initial collection process. I then newly installed onto it, all 20 apps onto the iPad and initially enabled all permissions for the apps through settings. After this was complete, I started collecting network traffic for the apps. As soon as the collection process started, uh, I opened all 20 apps and left them running in the background. I then went through one by one and interacted with each of the apps for about 15 minutes. If the apps, apps asked me for any additional, privilege, any additional permissions while I was interacting with them, I made sure to grant them. After about an hour and a half, my first round of collection was complete and I then stopped the man in the middle proxy and closed all the apps. Before beginning my next round of collection, I went into settings and disabled all the permissions for the apps. After that, I repeated the collection process for the second round as similarly to the first round as I could. I started the proxy, opened all the apps, and interacted with them for about 15 minutes again. I also used a script while interacting with the apps to make sure that I was doing the same things for the first and the second round. For example, when I was interacting with the Amazon app, I did a search for one item, viewed three different results, added one of the results to my cart, and then viewed one of the more like this options. The only thing I attempted to differ between the two rounds was my response when an app, prompt, app prompted me for more permissions. For the first round, I always made sure to grant the additional permissions, while for the second round, I made sure to always deny them. So before I go into what factors of privacy I decided to use when calculating privacy scores and how the privacy score is determined, let me first define what a privacy score is. For this study, a privacy score is a rating assigned to an app that helps users decide whether or not they should trust an app with their private information. The score tells the users how likely it is that a specific app is taking that user's private data to use in data trading. After I gathered all of my network traffic, <laughs> after I gathered all of my network traffic, I had to decide what factors were important when grading an app based off its use of private information. I ended up deciding on three factors, frequency, content, and length. For the purposes of this study, frequency was the number of seconds between transmissions. 
It was calculated by averaging the, first, averaging the time in between different transmissions sent from the device. For example, if the first transmission was at zero seconds, the next at five seconds, and the final at eight, the final frequency calculated would end up being four seconds. And just as a disclaimer for any electrical engineers listening, one of my E instructors has informed me multiple times that the proper term for this is period. However, the average user does not have an EE degree, and I believe that frequency is the term closer to what average users would use to describe this. The next privacy factor, length, is the number of bytes in a transmission. It's calculated by averaging the number of bytes in each transmission. For example, if the first transmission was 20 bytes in length, the next 12, and the final seven, your final length would end up being 13 bytes. My final factor of privacy is content. Deciding how to calculate content was a lot more difficult than it was with frequency and length. Because I wanted this process to be automated, I knew that I would not be able to individually look at each piece of information being sent out. In the end, I decided that calculating content by summing the total of unique information that was sent out of the device was the most beneficial. This way, when I went to compare the results of no permissions versus all permissions, I would be able to see if one was sending out way more different pieces of information than the other. For example, if with no permissions, the app was only sending out one piece of information over and over again, this would starkly contrast with if all permissions, the app was sending out four different pieces of information. Although I can't see what actual information is being sent, the jump in how much unique content sent is enough to raise concerns regarding privacy. So why are all of these factors important to privacy? Well, with content, what kind of information being sent out could mean the difference between an app only getting simple information, like your OS version, your specific user ID for the app, and your IP address, versus information most users would consider very private, like geolocation, contact info, and your camera roll. Similarly, the length of content being sent out also holds very important connotations regarding privacy. The size of information being sent could help indicate whether an app is only taking one photo, like maybe your profile picture for the app, or if it's collecting your entire camera roll. Finally, how frequent an app is sending out information about its users is very important to consider when calculating privacy. If the app is only collecting your location once or twice a day, it may get information like your home and your work address. However, the more frequent an app sends out your location, the much more information it gains. It could easily escalate to learn things like your favorite place to grab lunch while you're at work, where you drop your kids off for school, or even your favorite locations to go shopping. It could go so far as to know the exact route you use to travel from home to work. After I decided my factors for privacy, I had to figure out how I would calculate all this information from the network traffic that I collected. I began by separating the traffic by the specific apps that it had originated from. Each app was given its own file into which I placed the network traffic statistics for the app. I then created scripts that would calculate the frequency, length, and content for each of the different apps based on their network stat files. I started off my analysis with two raw network traffic files that were about 200 megabytes in length each. I then ran the raw network traffic files through a script that I created to separate it into different user agents, and then created a network stat file for each of the different user agents. On the screen, there's a clipping from the network stat file for the user agent Amazon underscore 267. As you can see, these files gave me important stats I would need when moving forward with my analysis. The last step of the script was to place each of the user agents into a file designated for the specific app. Some of the apps, like Amazon, had multiple user agents, like Amazon 267 and AWS SDK iOS, while other, while other apps, like Gmail, only had the one. After making more sense of the raw network traffic I had captured, I moved into calculating the frequency for the different apps. I calculated the frequency by grabbing the date parameter out of each of the different network stat files for a specific user agent. The average frequency was found by taking the differences in each of the date parameters and averaging them all together for the specific app. The end result was a simple text document showing the average, minimum, and maximum frequencies for different apps, as well as the total number of transmissions sent out by the apps during the collection period. This was run once to calculate the average frequency for apps with all of their permissions, and once more to calculate the average frequency for the apps when they had no permissions. 
these are my end results for uh, my frequency analysis. As you can see, I don't have statistics for all 20 apps due to SSL pinning, as apps that use SSL pinning either refused to work or kept their traffic encrypted. The apps all permission statistics are shown by the left bar, and there are no permission listed by the right bar. In the case of frequency, having an all permissions bar be uh, Having an all permissions bar be lower than the no permissions bar is a bad indicator. Take YouTube, for example. Its all permissions bar is much lower than its no permissions bar. This means that when YouTube is granted access to your private information, it's sending out transmissions a lot more often. often. Basically, YouTube gets a lot chattier when it has access to your private information. On the other side, Facebook's all permissions bar is slightly taller than its no permissions bar. This means that for both tests, Facebook's Facebook was sending out transmissions at about the same rate, so Facebook doesn't raise any red flags concerning privacy. Similarly to frequency, length was calculated by grabbing the content length parameter from the network stat files that I generated. The content length parameter was added for every transmission sent out by a certain app, and then its average length calculated. In the end, the script produced a file showing the average, minimum, maximum, and maximum length for each app's transmissions as well as the total transmissions sent out by the app. This was once again done twice. First to calculate the length for apps when they were granted no permissions, and again to calculate for when they were granted all permissions. Here you can see the final length statistics for the apps. The top bar is the average length for all permissions, and the bottom bar is the average length for no permissions. For length, having the all permissions bar be longer than the no permission bar indicates there might be privacy issues with the app. Take Bitmoji, for example. When the app had access to all, to all the user's private information, it was sending out much larger transmissions than when it, was, when it had no access to private information. In contrast, Wish's all permissions bar is smaller than its no permissions bar, meaning Wish was sending out larger transmissions when it didn't have access to private information, so Wish, Wish isn't raising any privacy concerns. For content, the post parameter within the network stat files was used to calculate it. Within the post parameter, each variable separated by an and sign re represents a different piece of information that was being sent to the app server. Each one of the unique pieces of information sent was summed. The final output file shows all the unique pieces of information sent as well as the total information sent during the collection period. These are the final con content statistics for the app. The left bar once again represents all permissions, while the right bar represents no permissions. In this case, having the all permissions bar be taller than the no permission bar means that there could be something fishy going on in terms of privacy. A great example of this is Facebook. Its all permissions bar is significantly taller. This means that when Facebook had access to private information, it was asking for a lot more information from the user than when it didn't have access to the same thing. However, Netflix's all permissions bar is shorter than its no permissions bar. This indicates that Netflix, Netflix was asking for less information from the user when it, when it had access to all permissions. After, after I calculated the different factors for each of the apps, I needed a way to produce a final privacy score for the app. I did this by making a rubric. For this rubric, receiving a score of one means that the app did not respect the user's private information at all while well, receiving a score of five means that the app was very respectful of a user's private information. An app receives a score for each of the different factors. This score is calculated by comparing the final steps for an app when it had all permissions versus when it had no permissions. I decided that comparing the apps to themselves would be the best way to evaluate each of them. This is because comparing apps to each other would not produce reliable results. What the app was originally created to do is gonna have a significant impact on its different factors. For example, I wouldn't wanna compare Netflix's average frequency to something like Bitmoji's. This is because Netflix is a streaming app and Bitmoji is a simple cartoon app that doesn't require an, inter an internet connection to work. Because of this, Bitmoji should have an average frequency to Netflix. I'll run through the process of grading two different apps, Wish and Amazon. As you can see, I have the final statistics listed for Amazon when it had no permissions versus when it had all permissions. For frequency, the no permission stat is divided by the all permission stat. In the end, we can see that with all permissions, Amazon was sending out transmissions a lot faster. 
Basically, Amazon gets a lot chattier when it has all of its permissions. For length, all permissions is divided by no permissions. When Amazon is granted all permissions, it sends out transmissions that are about 1.28 times larger than when it had no permissions. Finally, content is calculated by dividing all permissions by none. In the end, Amazon asked for 1.31 times more pieces of information when it had all permissions versus none. Now you take the app's comparisons between its no permissions transmissions and all permission transmissions and find the place it fits inside the rubric. Because Amazon's frequency was 3.83 times faster when all permissions granted versus none, it receives a rating of one for frequency. For length, Amazon's length was 1.28 times larger when all permissions were granted. Because of this, it receives a rating of four for length. Finally, Amazon requested 1.31 times more content when it had all permissions versus none. Due to this, Amazon's content received a rating of one. Once Amazon has received its rating for each of the different privacy factors, it can now be given an overall privacy score. A weighted average was used to calculate the final score, and uh, each app can receive a score between two and 10. Each of the individual factor ratings Amazon received in the rubric are multiplied by two thirds and added. Overall, Amazon received a six out of 10, with a 10 being the best privacy score an app could receive. Amazon's score was significantly lowered due to the fact that the app was much more chatty when it had all permissions. For the next example, I'll walk through uh, rating the Wish app. Since most of my instructors had to ask me what Wish was, I feel the need to clarify for my older generations. Wish is a retail app kind of similar to eBay, almost a cross between Etsy and eBay. Before Wish can receive its overall score, the differences between its all permissions and no permissions granted uh, must be calculated. For frequency, Wish was 1.16 times faster when all permissions were granted versus none. In terms of length, you can see that with the 0.91 times larger, Wish's length was actually slightly shorter when all permissions were granted versus none. Again, with a difference of 0.62, Wish also requested slightly less information when all permissions were granted versus none. Onto the rubric. Wish's frequency difference of 1.16 fall between 1 and 1.5, giving it a rating of 4. Because Wish's length and content differences, 0.91 and 0.62 respectively, were both under 1, Wish receives a rating of 5 for both factors. Finally, with, with each of Wish's privacy factors multiplied by 2 thirds, Wish receives an overall privacy score of 9, meaning that users can be almost positive that Wish will not infringe on their privacy information. Now I'm going to move into a demo of how this all works. This is a diagram of how my equipment is set up at the moment. My laptop is getting internet from ShmooCon's internet. The Raspberry Pi is connected through ethernet to my laptop and is acting as a hotspot. My iPad then connects to that hotspot through which the man in the middle proxy is running. For this demo, my Raspberry Pi is already set up to act as a hotspot and has the man in the middle proxy software downloaded onto it. Additionally, the iPad I will be using has the man in the middle's proxy certificate downloaded. If you want to try, want to try and recreate this process I'm about to show, the demo steps in my GitHub repository list out how to do everything from the very beginning. The first thing that must be done before you can start collecting traffic from your device is to change the initial permission settings. You can do this by going to settings. At the very bottom of the initial settings page, each of the apps installed on the device is listed. While you should enable permissions, while you should enable permissions for all the apps that you're going to test, I'm going to do this just with TikTok and Uber because they are the only two that I'm going to be demoing with today. Uh, and as you can see, all you have to do is click on the app and uh, click through each of the permissions to make sure any of the, any that they have asked for are granted. And then there's one more place that you need. Uh, to make sure that permissions are enabled, and that's in the privacy section. So this is where each of the, like your different pieces of private information, if apps want access to them, they have to go and request it here. So just click through all of these and make sure that if they, your apps have asked for any permissions right here, then they're granted. Okay, so once your permission settings are configured properly, the first round of network trafficking, network traffic capturing can begin. To start the proxy on the Raspberry Pi, enter the command man in the middle, man in the middle dump 
dash m for mode. For this demo, I'm gonna be running the proxy of the SOX5 proxy. If you wanna write to the network traffic that is collected to a uh, file, use dash w in the name of the file you wanna write to. In this case, I'm using ap for all permissions. Run the command and then you should see a message appear letting you know that the proxy is running successfully. After that, all you have to do is start interacting with one of your apps. To know that your proxy is actually capturing network traffic, you should start to see the different connections being printed out to the proxy's interface. Pink and green messages you see on the screen are connections that the man in the middle proxy has successfully intercepted and decrypted. The yellow messages are connections that refuse to uh, work with man in the middle's proxy more suspicious certificate. As you can see, TikTok is cooperating fairly well with the proxy as very few of the messages seen are yellow. However, when you move over, when we move over to the Uber app, which is an app that uses SSL pinning, the connection is gonna look significantly different. So as you can see now, most of uh, the messages are yellow, meaning that Uber is not connecting through the man in the middle proxy. In fact, most of the apps that use SSL pinning refuse to even let you like log in or have any kind of connection through it. Okay, so now that traffic is captured for TikTok and Uber when they have all privacy commission permissions, the proxy can be shut down and all permissions disabled for the apps. So I'm only going to disable permissions for the apps at the very bottom because I know that TikTok and Uber haven't requested any permissions through the privacy. But if you do this on your own, definitely go back and make sure to dis disable permissions in the privacy section because you will have apps that requested permissions there. Okay, so now you wanna run the proxy again. Okay, um, please be careful when you're running the command to use another file name because it's really easy to accidentally write over one of your raw network traffic files I can personally assure you it's extremely disappointing to lose two hours of captured traffic because you ran the, ran the same command twice without changing the file name. Once again, you should get a message stating that the proxy is listening for new traffic. Now, now, that all that's, now that that's all complete, all you have to do is interact with your apps again. So while I read, let TikTok run for a minute, I'm gonna talk about some of the issues that I ran into while setting all of this up. The main one is the proxy.pack file. It's in the GitHub repository and the URL to the proxy.pack file is, what, uh, is what's listed under the, as for the iPad as like the proxy settings. So what the file is basically doing is returning the Raspberry Pi's ether um, IP and port address so that your iPad knows where to go for the proxy. However, um, this has to, the issue I ran into is that it has to be the Ethernet's IP address and not the Wi-Fi's IP address. If you put the Wi-Fi, it's not gonna work because uh, the man in the middle is running on the Ethernet. Okay, almost there. And now we're gonna switch over to Uber. <coughs> and Uber, once again, it will not work. Also, if your laptop, when you're doing this, is set up with an internet that, that's looking for rogue access points, it's not gonna work because it's gonna identify your Raspberry Pi as a rogue access point and you won't be able to connect through it. Okay. So now that, now that um, you've finished capturing traffic, we can start to analyze them. As you can see, two of the files of network traffic I just captured are already sitting in my directory waiting to be analyzed. Even in just a short time, uh, the raw network traffic files have already become pretty large. Going through them by hand and trying to make sense of all the information is pretty much impossible. So thankfully, I have a script to do it all for me. To start the analysis, all you need to do is run the Python file called main function. Uh, there are three additional Python files in my directory. All of those do have to be there in order for the main function file to work. 
The first thing the script's gonna ask you is what you named the file to which you captured the network traffic for apps when they had no permissions. In this case, I just called it NP. Next, it's gonna prompt you for the file name for when the apps had all permissions. The script is then gonna start going through the raw traffic and separating it by user agents. In the script is a dictionary that ca contains all of the user agents I previously stumbled across when doing my original capture. If the script doesn't know when an app, what app a new user agent goes to, it'll prompt you for the app. In this case, it's pretty apparent that the specific user agent goes with the, goes with the app TikTok because the user agent is called TikTok 14, 10, 12. However, the user agents used by apps are not always this apparent. Netflix, for example, likes to use different forms of the name Argo for its user agents. So if you do ever come across a user agent you don't, you know, don't know, usually a quick Google search will yield the answer. Additionally, if there is a user agent you don't know and can't Google it, uh, list it as no idea, no idea and then go into a network stat file. I know I had a user agent show up called com.google and I had no idea which of like my Google apps that I went to, but when I ran it, went to the network, network stat files, there were a couple of perimeters that mentioned YouTube and it was, became pretty apparent that the user agent went to Netflix, or to YouTube. So after the script is finished, parse, finished parsing the files into different user agents, it's gonna start calculating the scores for the two apps. The first three results of, are the app's difference factors between its no permissions communications versus its all permissions communications. As you can see, the more than just TikTok and Uber's traffic was picked up. The Facebook traffic shown is most likely one of the apps using Facebook's ex extensions in its own app. The Apple statistics shown is a general catch-all for everything your Apple device is doing in the background. The last results are the app's final privacy scores. TikTok did well because it remained consistent in its transmissions between all and no permissions. Uber did not get a rating because, uh, because rating did not get a rating because the proxy could not capture any of its traffic, thus the main issue with SSL pinning. While the script is running, it generates a lot, lots of different files that can be used for additional analysis. It creates two directories, all perms and no perms, of course standing for all permissions and no permissions. Inside of these directories, you will find the network stat files for each of the different apps. I have one directory for every app that had traffic captured by man in the middle. Inside of the file for TikTok contains extra information for every transmission TikTok sent out. These files can be used for additional analysis and comparison. And as you can see, within these files are the content length, date, and post parameters that I use to calculate my privacy differences. The other The other set of files uh, generated by the script are the different stats for each of the factors of privacy. For each of the different factors, there's a file for all permissions and no permissions. So as you can see for content, this one is a pretty important file to go through because it's gonna list all the different pieces of content that your device sent to the server. So right now there's not a whole lot of content that was being sent because I only ran the capture for a, like a minute or two. But you can see that TikTok sent out one piece of information called built number. And then the other two files for frequency and length are pretty similar. And as you can see, uh, in addition to the average frequency that's used to calculate the um, final privacy score, you also have the min frequency the max frequency, and the total transmission sent out. Okay, so real quick, I'm gonna go through my code. Now before I actually show you all my code, please remember that I am in fact an IT major, and the fact that my code functions how it's supposed to is a miracle in itself. Uh, so the first thing, that I did was import a class called flow read exception. This class is specifically designed in order to uh, parse out different headers and things from the raw network traffic files. The first thing that my, oh, and then you can see at the top, I have the user dictionary. So within this dictionary, I have listed all the different user agents in the app that they go to. Uh, uh, 
and then the first thing that my app or that the script does is make directories called no perms and all perms to put the different broad network traffic files in. And then, and then there's only one function defined within this file, and this is the function that reads through the raw network traffic. This is actually the only function that actually interacts with the not raw network traffic files uh, and produces the network stat files. Every other function after this purely interacts with the network stat files. I did this because it's actually pretty confusing and a little difficult to interact with the raw network traffic because there's so much information and not all of, it, not all of it's relevant to you. So I found that just using the final file that this outputs was the best solution. So after that, uh, I've called a thing called, I called a function called final function, which for no permissions and for all permissions, what this one does is it's, it's outprinting the difference private, different factors, differences for each of the privacy factors to the screen, and it's also writing the files that I showed you for like content, frequency, and length. And then the final function called is called calc final score, and this is the function that does the calculations for the final privacy score and then print it out to the screen. And that is all that I have to present. Does anybody have any questions? No, they're not, but I can put them on there. Oh, uh, is there also a recommendation that I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> is there a way that I can contact you? Just like, uh, on the report, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I could, the file, the files could definitely be posted to the GitHub really okay. easily, so uh, probably like 30 minutes after this presentation, okay. the files will be up there. Anything else? Now I know how my instructors feel. I'm sorry, I still can't, can you come closer? I still can't hear you. That microphone definitely doesn't work. I'm sorry, the, um, what I'm asking is, is the, the average user on iOS, should that person just basically shut off all permissions on the possible because it prevents kind of exfiltration of data or data? Is that something you would recommend? Um, so the question was, should, would I recommend to users shutting off like all access to like their private information when they can? I mean, definitely, ideally, like, I would shut off any access to, like, your information if you can, like, and only enable it when you really need access to it, but not every user is going to do that, and so. Okay. Like. Thank you. Yeah. Have you tried this with uh, Android at all? So the question was if I've tried it with Android. The answer is no. I, there was, there's already been a study previously conducted purely with Android apps, and I didn't want to just recreate the study, so I have not done it with Android. Yeah, I was wondering if you could actually, like, compile the app and mm -hmm. turn off the certificate that you Hi. So if I understood correctly, um, with Netflix, you said it actually uses less traffic when the permissions are on. Is that correct? And did you reason through yes. why uh, that was? So the, the question was, Netflix, did Netflix have less traffic when permissions were on? And that, yes, Netflix did have less permissions when the traffic was on. However, there's a lot of different reasons that that could be happening. Maybe like it was the first time I opened the app and it was syncing it, or just like in general, just a lot of other things the apps could be doing. The purpose of this presentation was not for me to have like super reliable like privacy scores for all of these. I didn't want to stand up here and be like, you should all delete Amazon from your phones and download Wish because it's a way better retail app. The purpose was to uh, just kind of give people a way to evaluate their different apps. To actually be able to re produce reliable results that I would be like, y'all should actually look at this and believe it, we need to do the study for a much longer period of time which a much, with a much larger group of people.
So if there's time for one more thing. As an imp interpretation to that, um, I have found that when you, essentially what you're doing is every time that an app wants to communicate with its service, and it's a combination of ingress and egress, when you block access to these API domains that want to collect information from you, they contact you much more frequently. So mm -hmm. for example, your frequency graph was a lot higher mm -hmm. when no permissions were set because Facebook wants to say, hey, do I have contact info? Hey, do I have contact info? But the iPhone keeps saying, no, I don't, no, I don't. So it will contact it more frequently. For all it knows, you're just not connected to the internet, right? It can't reach out to the graph API or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, I found that when you block access to these APIs, you'll get hundreds if not thousands of more requests. Mm -hmm. For example, Windows does this thousands of times per day, right? So I think that's kind of the reason why the graphs were shifted like that. Mm -hmm. No permissions has a higher frequency but less content, right? So mm -hmm. to kind of, that's what it was going for. Mm -hmm. so. But I have no question. <laughs> Uh, just to recap that, he said that uh, when you disable all permissions, the sites that are actually trying to steal all of your information uh, like contact you way, from, way more often because they keep checking, being like, hey, like, can, I, uh, can, I, can I have your information now? Any, anything else? Hello, Major Stickney. Thank you for putting that up there. I appreciate it. Were you able to find instances of when you turn permissions off where, let's say I don't want the weather app taking my location data, were you able to find instances where they were still doing that like after running a test like this? Oh yeah, so Apple is always like stealing your information. I had, I showed y'all like in the background uh, or like when I ran that one that you were still getting like traffic from Apple and I don't, I could not find a way to turn off permissions for like Apple specifically and there's a lot of user agents called like location and stuff that are specifically for Apple that are still being transmitted even with all permissions to it off. So in general, having an iPhone is a privacy risk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think there's time for one more. Um, so were you discriminating at all in your traffic? Were you just looking at the headers of all the network traffic coming through and just saying, if there was traffic, then this was violating my privacy? Or were you taking any look at what the data actually contained and how that could pertain to our privacy in that way? So the question was if I looked into like the actual information that was being sent out, the question is, or the answer is no, I didn't. Because it's not realistic, or at least for me, it wasn't realistic to be able to write some kind of code that could go through like the thousands of different pieces of information that your device could be posting, especially when I found that a lot of the apps call the exact same piece of information by a lot of different names. I think that's about time, so. <laughs>